Hello and welcome. My name is Ravi Abiwaldana. I'm the Technical Director here at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this session. It is my pleasure to introduce you to this remarkable panel of speakers we have gathered for you today. Please uh, welcome Ron Gutierrez, Policy Advisor at Umedium, uh, Rafael uh, Camargo, Technical Project Manager at the WWF, Frederick Hellman, Climate Resilience Lead at AstraZeneca, Michael Alexander, Global Head of Environmental uh, at Diageo, Francesco um, Cote, uh, Global Head of Research at DWS, and CDSB's very own Francesca Riconte, Technical Manager and Environmental Specialist, and the lead author of the Water Guidance, which we have launched today. Our session is dedicated to, um, to, to the Water Guidance. Um, uh, um, yeah, dedicated to Water Guidance. Each of the speakers have their a unique and insightful perspective on this very important work in a hot topic at the moment. So why is it a hot topic? For one, it is connected to global warming. The sixth IPCC report on climate change released just this month cites growing evidence of climate extremes such as heat waves, droughts, heavy precipitation and tropical, tropical cyclones caused by human influence. Sadly, we do not need to go far to observe the effects of this disruption, with droughts and flooding happening globally right before our eyes. This disruption means that, the, that businesses on which we depend for goods and services may, ex, uh, may experience increasingly financial uh, material consequences and the need to prepare accordingly to mitigate and disclose appropriately. As the old saying goes, if you can't manage it, uh, no, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, sorry. Companies are facing growing measure, um, growing pressure from investors to disclose decision, useful, consistent and comparable water-related financial information. The water guidance released today complements CDSB's framework, which is well aligned to the TCFD recommendations. It is produced for companies to enhance their reporting of water information in the mainstream financial filings with the same rigour as financial information. Ultimately, this enables investors to, to assess the information they need to drive capital towards resilient and water secure economy. Essential to this information is the topic of materiality. Those who are closely follow the developments around sustainability reporting standards surely know that, that materiality is another very hot topic. We hear a lot, of, um, a lot of debate around whether companies should disclose only the financial materiality or double materiality, which is, for example, applied in the case of the upcoming corporate sustainability reporting directive in the European Union. From our perspective, double materiality and financial materiality go hand in hand. One hand feeds the other. In 2020, together with other standard setters, we jointly published a shared vision for sustainability reporting, which addresses the dynamic nature of materiality and its focus on enterprise value creation. It serves as the basis for the International Sustainability Standards Board under the leadership of the IFRS Foundation. Dynamic materiality means that the concerns of one stakeholder group may quickly become material for financial decision makers. As you can see on your screen in front of you, the illustration shows that water issues may move from broader sustainability issues to become financially material, either gradually or very quickly impacting either positive or negatively, a company's financial condition and the operations and its ability to execute its strategy in the future. I encourage you to download the water guidance and have a closer look at chapter one for comprehensive description of dynamic materiality and enterprise value in relation to water. During this session, we will cover the physical impacts of water that are, that are or may become material for your, to your business. Regulations around the world is moving very, very fast and reporting on sustainability issues such as 
on water risks and opportunities are very likely to become mandatory, just as we assume with the TCFD recommendations. In the next 50 minutes, <clears throat> Ron will talk about the state of water-related disclosure in the Netherlands, as well as policy movements around Europe. Raphael will provide an outlook on water-related risks globally, followed by case studies on water reporting from AstraZeneca and Diageo, delivered by Frederick and, uh, and Michael, respectively. Fran uh, Francesco will present his vision on water-related risks from an investor perspective, before handing over to Francesca for a brief presentation on the water guidance. A final note to the audience, I would like to invite as many, uh, many of you to actually raise questions throughout the actual presentation. So please ask them in the chat in the event page. We'll try our best to address those questions in the live, um, 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 via the live chat. And if time permits, we'll go back and answer your questions in the chat before the event as well. So now over to yourself, Ron. Thank you, uh, Ravi, and um, thank you for your kind invitation to take part in this webinar. I hope everybody can uh, can hear and, and see me well. I will not be using uh, any slides, so so you'll have to do with uh, with my face today. Um, so first of all, my congratulations to the whole team for producing this very welcome guidance, which I sincerely, I really sincerely hope that it will guide both preparers and standard setters alike to sign significantly improve water-related reporting. And I believe that the timing of this publication could not have been better, not just for preparers to improve their own awareness of water-related issues and their disclosures, but perhaps most of all for policymakers and standard setters throughout the world. And if you'll allow me, I'll use my time to briefly reflect on this and um, why it's certainly the case uh, for Europe. And then uh, my fellow panelists will later on uh, surely dive deeper into the substance of water-related reporting itself. Now, at Median, it was already said, we are a platform of institutional investors and we improved, uh, promote good governance and sustainability with listed companies, specifically in the Netherlands. And at Umedian, we deal every day with company disclosure on all matters related to governance and sustainability. And on behalf of our members, we engage with companies throughout the year on how they address sustainability risks, how they make best use of opportunities, and how they focus on long-term value creation for all of the stakeholders. And um, generally speaking, I'd say that for most companies, it used to be so that either a sustainability issue is, is inherently and very much in your face. And thus, we as investors would at least find some reporting on it um, um, yeah, yeah, on a specific topic. But if it, it's not so, if it's not so in your face, our discussions and our questions would soon end with a, well, yes, we'll have a look uh, into that and uh, we'll get back to you next year. But I think this is changing and not the least due to the fact that frameworks um, such as the TCFD do not just focus on disclosing indicators or metrics, but on the company's overall and systematic approach to such issues. And this is what frameworks such as the TCFD have, uh, such as the TCFD have done for climate. And that is why climate is long since not just being discussed with, for example, just oil and gas companies, but other companies as well. Now in the Netherlands, the state of um, water-related disclosure is nowhere near this point, not yet. And on this topic too, um, the investors' evaluation of how companies deal with water-related issues actually also needs to be fed by a company's own systematic analysis and disclosure on it. And this will ultimately allow our more in-depth discussions to be held with many more companies than, you know, for example, just the um, producer of beverages, right? Just to name a usual suspect when it comes to what to use. But this requires reporting to go beyond the number of liters of water, water used or discharged. But it requires a systematic focus on the broader issues, including protection of water, marine resources, and water risks. And as Harvey already pointed out, this, this need has unfortunately been underlined recently by uh, floodings also in, in Western Europe. So that's companies on the one hand, but there's also an important role to play for policymakers and standard setters as well. 
And the guidance published today can have a major influence on the speed and the quality of improving water-related disclosure requirements. Let me explain. As many uh, of you will be aware, here in Europe, the European Commission has been working on a comprehensive approach to sustainable finance for some years now. And this includes developing a taxonomy to classify economic activities that impact the environment. But it also includes disclosure requirements for us as institutional investors. And recently, it also includes a proposal for mandatory European sustainability reporting standards. And interest uh, interestingly, um, specifically in relation to water, many of these requirements and upcoming tools um, are actually still um, under development and will be developed for water in the upcoming phase. So that's a very clear opportunity for the current guidance being uh, published today. Now, first of all, I think the taxonomy uh, already mentioned, it will soon be extended to also cover water uh, related environmental objectives, namely sustainable use of water and the protection of water and marine resources. And this common dictionary, as you may call it, will lay the groundwork for more detailed requirements, also in terms of disclosure for both companies and for investors alike. Now, in terms of this um, company disclosure, the most important development there is the uh, upcoming um, European Sustainability Reporting Standard, still under negotiation at European level, but already in the works. Um, currently in the early phase of development, and it will eventually include systematic reporting on all environmental objectives uh, currently included under the taxonomy, so including water. And the European Commission envisioned that this reporting should be along the lines of the TCD framework, which ensures that, more, that there will be a more thorough consideration of um, water or any environmental issue um, that actually goes beyond just mere reporting of metrics. Then it will address a company's governance, a company's strategy, uh, the assessment of risk, the assessment of opportunities, and it will also include a more performance-oriented section. And I, again, I believe the guidance published today will provide a very useful blueprint for these standards. And thirdly, for institutional investors, they uh, will also be required to report on water-related issues uh, regarding uh, company performance in their investment products or in their investment portfolios. And under the current proposal, these disclosures are actually still fairly limited, I would say. And they relate to water usage and to whether or not a company has a water management policy. Um, but I believe that more systematic corporate reporting on this issue will eventually also uh, feed the improved and more useful disclosure requirements for investors. So I would like to urge the European Commission as well to consider in their periodic review um, how improved corporate disclosure can in turn also improve investor disclosure on this uh, topic. And very briefly, looking um, beyond the European Union, I would say that the momentum for conversion of international sustainability reporting standards is undeniably there. So seeing how the various projects, uh, I, I named the EU, but also the IFRSs, they all aim to focus on building on what is already out there, not reinventing the wheel. And I'm actually very glad to see that this guidance published today can now officially be part of the existing frameworks and of the existing standards that will in turn feed those global developments in corporate reporting as well. So once again, congratulations to the whole team on this great result and thank you very much for your attention. Now, thank you CDSB for organizing this very relevant session on disclosing water information. And well connect to this point, I, Rafael Camargo from DataWF, would like to give my talk uh, an overview on scenarios of water risks. So in the past decade, year after year, water is ranked one of the top global risks in terms of its impacts. And, but most of other risks of highest impact and likelihood are also water related, as those underlined here in red, such as climate action failure, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, involuntary migration, and that's to name just only a few. And if we keep business as usual, half of the world's population and GDP will be under high water risk by 2050. Then it's somewhat alarming to see that only a small share of companies 
are using climate scenarios to inform their business strategy. But my question is actually, how comprehensively do they cover water risks? To give you an idea of the manifolds of water risks and their potential implications, I will show you a few examples. And that's the current picture of water scarcity risk, where risk levels vary from very low, represented in shades of green, to very high in shades of red. And they hash the hashed lines depicting where scarcity risks are projected to increase in the coming years. As we can see, regions of high risk today are generally the same ones that we will project, uh, have projected to increase even more. And that's worrisome, as we already seen over the past few years, a number of examples across the globe where billions of dollars were lost due to water scarcity. And here we, we see just a few estimated figures regarding the direct impacts locally because of reduced crop yields or high, higher electricity costs or et cetera. But nowadays with the global supply chains, a drought in Taiwan, for example, led to reduce production of semiconductors and that impacted the automotive industry worldwide. However, water risk is not only about water scarcity. Water risks can manifest in many different ways and floods is another one with potential for great damage. We see that with a warmer uh, climate, Devastating floods are expected to become more frequent in vast pa parts of the globe. And, but companies should not consider that although floods may not reach their facilities, such events may inundate their suppliers, may disrupt their distribution, or can take their consumers' houses. And that will definitely impact their, their business too. So that's was a second example and a third example, water quality is another good one, which could mean disruption in production or higher operating costs as companies need to purify water prior to their operations, but also as the fact that water pollution can lead to health issues affecting companies, workforce and consumers alike. And to wrap it up, I would like to reiterate that climate change will continue to exacerbate water risks and that will be manifested in multiple ways. Therefore, companies to avoid more losses, they, they need to better consider the different locations of the globe may need different to address water risks in different manner. And water risk is not only about water scarcity or water stress, water use or efficiency, as most companies are used to consider when reporting. It's very important to cover physical aspects, as I just showed here, as well as regulatory and reputational risks. For example, bad water governance usually potentialize the impacts of physical risk, and this should be accounted when reporting. Also, water cannot be seen only as its procurement value. Water is essential to create value, uh, to create value for everybody and every business. Actually, companies might be unable to grow if water risks are not properly addressed. And to finalize, it's time to better understand that water dependency and opportunities throughout value chains have their, their impact and to integrate water into business strategies as highlighted in this WWF report here on the right. And that was a, a quick look at water risks. Thank you. Um, thanks, Raphael. And then moving over to, to AstraZeneca presentation. So if take the next slide, please. <clears throat> and the patient first is one of AstraZeneca's core value and the very, at the very heart of what we, all we do. To ensure the safety of patients and their continued, continued access to care and medicines, we set a focus on our four disease areas, which is respiratory, cardiovascular, oncology, and rare diseases. Climate change is a growing threat for the global society and also for AstraZeneca when we're delivering our uh, life-changing medicines to patients. Therefore, a core business 
uh, is very much supported by our sustainability strategy that have a clear focus on access to medicines, environmental protection with climate risks embedded, and also ethics and transparency. Uh, to even increase focus on our climate resilience, we decided back in 2019 to support a framework of Task Force for Climate-Related Finance Disclosure, the TCFD, and made the first report in the end of 2020. And key arguments for us was really to find, to find ways to future-proof the business and also meet up with further questions on, on from investors what climate change means to us. My name is Fredrik Hellman and I work as a climate resilience lead in AstraZeneca, a role very much put in place uh, to lead this work globally for us. And today I'm going to brief you on ways of working and how we integrate water stewardship also in this process as one of the, the principal aspects of climate change. To, without going into much details, here's a summary of the TCFD framework, as you can see. Uh, and to me, it's very much a structured system of how to manage climate-related risks and opportunities in a systematic and a transparent way aligned with science. So you can see the governance piece, the strategy, the risk management, split it in fiscal risks and also transition risks, uh, and then reflecting this in, in matri setting matrix and targets. And I would say this builds very nicely into the work we have uh, been doing since we first launched our science-based targets back in 2015, even if we now need to add some new aspects to the work. Uh, and for us, this started very much as a nice to have, uh, but this year we are mandated to report against TCFD as a premium listed company in the UK. Next slide, please. Uh, we are, uh, the first thing we learned from TCFD was the use of climate scenarios to better understand what the future risks look like in the short and long term. So we decided to go for the RCP 4.5, meaning two degree increase end of century, and also the worst case scenario, RCP 8.5, with a four degree increase, which is unfortunately the very much trajectory that we work on right now. We also used a low carbon scenario to understand what transition risks mean for us, but also opportunities moving into a low carbon economy as, for example, uh, legal aspects and uh, green expectations from, from customers. So we know that those scenarios are recently being updated in the sixth assessment report from IPCC. So that's something we right now are uh, considering how that can impact the assessment we already have done. Next slide, please. So uh, in this slide, you can see how we expose our supply chain to scenarios, I'm the one I just mentioned, to see how the hazards can impact our capability to deliver medicines and how we integrate the climate risks into our governance and risk management process, and when needed, also into our strategic and financial planning processes to really make this as future part of BIU. We started by doing a screening in 2019 to get the big picture by using available open data sources on climate scenarios and we now have validated screening results at our first five sites by doing local assessments with higher granularity to understand the need of mitigations before we go into next 10 sites before ending this year. Climate risks is not currently assessments being finalized. Next slide, please. Uh, now, a deeper look at our work with water stewardship as one of the climate hazards. On this slide, you can see sites with a material water consumption in the group, and the reds are indicating a location in the water scarcity area. So we have a long history of working with water conservation plans and efficiency projects as part of managing natural resources. So back from 2015, we've invested more than $100 million in driving efficiency at, in those aspects. In 2020, we started a new collaboration with uh, Rafael and the, his friends in WWF. So with their expertise, by using their water risk filter, we are analyzing now physical risks, reputational risks, and also regulatory water risks. And the outcome 
of this is now integrated into the earlier mentioned climate risk screening we did in, we already have behind us. And together with WWF, we are now also moving into the direction towards setting contextual water targets, uh, which also then includes uh, not just consumption, but access to water, the quality of water resources, with us also impacting some of, the, some of them with our activities, and also collective actions when we need to include other stakeholders in those river basins. And to exemplify what that work can look like, I'm going to bring you to one of our locations in India, Chennai, where we have one of our global technology centers. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, in the 2019, there was one of the worst droughts in decades for Chennai, and almost all water reservoirs supplying city in uh, the city ran dry, affecting over 10 million people in combination in combination with floods in 2015, which displaced over 1.8 million people. Strong, that was a strong reminder to, to Chennai that Chennai is one of the most environmentally vulnerable sites at AstraZeneca. High risk of water scarcity was therefore identified by the site and it was escalated to corporate level to have support. And working with the local community, a strong employee support, we partnered with local organizations to find nature-based solutions, such as restoration of several ponds and lakes in the area. And you can see one of them, the Natar Pond on this slide, that for many years was used as a landfill. And the work involved removal of waste and replacing invasive plants with native species. Slowly, the pond went back to its original shape, as you can see on this slide. So the restoration helped us preventing floods during monsoon by buffering the flash floods, recharging the groundwater table and help regulate temperature locally and also restoring biodiversity. So things like this would probably be more common across more sites in a in the future. And I think this shows a very great example, building both centrally and, and locally supported. Next slide, please. This was very much on our adaption to mitigation and just ending that we are not forgetting how to mitigate reduction of our, our green gas emissions. So by 2025, we're reducing our emissions in own operations uh, down to zero by 2025 and in the full network um, and uh, our scope three emissions, uh, we're going beyond net zero to negative emissions by 2030. And we have a, one million budget to address this, which is an fantastic to, to, to have that opportunity. And we also, in addition, started to plant over 50 million trees and restoration of forests to, to help this uh, activity as well. Thank you for listening. Over to you. Thank you very much, Frederick. That's very interesting and uh, and delighted to be here today. I think what I have to say is very complimentary uh, to what you've just said, so that's good. Uh, my name is Michael Alexander. I'm Global Head of Environment for Diageo, and I'm very pleased to be here today to share some of our experiences and and to learn from others. I think we're all on a on a and on a journey of learning at the moment. So um, hopefully, uh, the next ten minutes, you'll learn something from me, and I'll learn something from everybody else. So next slide, please. Just very briefly, uh, Diageo is a global drinks company, alcohol beverage company. We have operations in about 30 countries, 150 manufacturing sites. Um, we have about 30,000 employees. Uh, to give you some sense of how important water is to us, uh, we use water to grow our crops, uh, to make our products, to clean our sites, to uh, cool our beverages, to sometimes when you enjoy some scotch, maybe add a little bit to the final product. Uh, so it's a true water use from grain to glass, and it's an absolute fundamental uh, part of our product. Obviously, 60% of spirits is water and 90% of beer is water. So we use water grain to glass. It's absolutely fundamental and it's clearly very important. Next slide, please. So where do we use it in particular? We're in vulnerable places. Well, this is a map of our water stress sites, not too dissimilar to Frederick's map across AstraZeneca. Um, we have 44 water stress sites across 14 countries and four continents, I think. Importantly, in, this, uh, in the context of this discussion, 
our production from these water stress sites accounts for about a third of our global volume. So a third of our global volume uh, is um, produced at sites that are in water stressed areas. And that means that there's a very high priority. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we adopt it? We have adopted that. How do we adopt a framework for managing our water risk and our climate risk? So water is our number one climate risk. Uh, so we've adopted the same TCFD framework for integrating water and climate into one consolidated integrated approach. And like everybody else, and to ensure consistency, we've adopted the TCFD framework for climate and water risk reporting. So we look at the impact that Diageo is having on the environment, and then, or, and then looking at the impact of climate change and water risk on Diageo, and then linking how that translates into our financial statements and how we report that externally. And as I say, we're on a learning curve here, and we need to understand how this framework can help us measure, manage, quantify, and report our water risk against the TCFD framework using these categories and understanding that it has to be integrated into our global financial reporting as a business, not seen as a separate reporting arm or a separate line in the annual report, the strategy report. Next slide, please. So just like everybody else in terms of uh, uh, climate risk, we've adopted the same uh, categorization uh, uh, that TCFD recommends, looking at physical risk and transition risk. Uh, this is, can be applied obviously to broader climate risk. And uh, uh, although water is our number one uh, climate risk, it's not our only climate risk, but we view this through the water lens and we look at acute and chronic water risk. We look at acute in terms of um, a floods and droughts and, and weather incidences. And then we look at chronic in terms of sea level rises, weather patterns um, and general temperature increases. So that's the kind of physical risk side and applying the water lens to it. And then on transition risks, we look at policies around water allocation, technology around water, uh, water pricing, uh, reputation is a very important part of water and obviously market forces and consumer sentiments as well. So very much adopting that same framework of TCFD and applying it across the board and water as our number one climate change risk. Next slide, please. And this is, a, this is a slide that I've used in the past and I find quite a helpful uh, um, framework for looking at the detail of water risks in particular, not just climate change more broadly, but looking across the key water drivers. I think the only area that we could add here uh, is probably number six would be biodiversity. Uh, so if we added biodiversity across these areas of water risk drivers, then uh, that would be the full complement. But the main point here is just to demonstrate that these drivers are having impacts on the business uh, and that this impact on the business then drives impact on the income statement and balance sheet. And to recognize that that has a direct, a direct cor correlation between the water risk and the revenue and capital expenditure and asset risk disclosure is really important to us to make sure that water risk is integrated within the whole business system, if you like, uh, within the Azure rather than seeing as a sustainability or an ESG reporting requirement. So next slide, please. So how do we make this come to life? Uh, how do we use the frameworks and the categorizations and the reporting recommendations of TCFD and actually kind of translate that into understanding what our water risk is and importantly, disclosing it, managing it and disclosing it. Well, we're on a multi-year journey, everybody else is. We're understanding the risk, we're assessing and managing their impact. And we've uh, been disclosing to stakeholders for some time on water, and then more recently on water risk and understanding where the specific um, elements of that financial impact are. So uh, you see here on the right-hand side of this slide, that's an extract from our recently published annual report, giving a little bit of a feel for the journey we've taken. Uh, like Frederick, we've done a lot of work recently on water risk assessment and climate change risk assessment. We did that across all our portfolio in Scotland and North America. So that was a, a total of 59 sites across Scotland and North America. And that those geographies represent about half of our net sales value. So really driven from what the value at risk is here and understanding what the climate change risk, the water risk is, 
across both physical and transition dimensions. But clearly we've got to go further. So we'll do uh, um, India and Africa, perhaps even getting to Mexico and Latin America in uh, next financial year and learning how in the future years, how to, we can embed that and understand the risk and, and keep quantifying it. Next slide, please. And on that quantification, just like Frederick, we've talked about uh, scenario planning and how important scenario planning is to disclosure uh, according to the TCFD recommendations. Uh, and we looked at three different scenarios here across RCP 2.6, 4.5 and 8.5. And within scope, uh, uh, water, the, 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 the bottom line in this table uh, was in scope for 4.5 and 8.5. 2.6 was largely transition risk. And if we look at what's in scope in terms of the risk uh, across 4.5 and 8.5, we know through the scenario analysis that there will be disruption to, to production. Uh, and we tried to quantify this by looking at its different scenarios of disruption. And we know that there'll be lost revenue as a result of that disruption. And we've quantified that as well. Added costs through the deduction, maybe some damage to assets, but particularly adds to our cost of goods and also revenue uh, for gone. So we quantified that and uh, start to understand the, the impact of that across uh, the different uh, sites that were in scope. And we disclosed that in F21. So very much a learning part of our kind of disclosures. The first time we've really gone into any detail on scenario planning and including water, all our sites across the world, or all our water stress sites, so that 44 sites were included in this scope uh, and, and integrating that into our climate change scenario planning. Next slide, please. So how are we mitigating that risk? Well, we've done a lot of work in integrating and understanding the risk into our risk management systems and business reporting systems. Well, for a lot longer, we've been looking at uh, how to do good corporate water stewardship, probably 15 years now. And we've adapted that and grown that process as, as we've recognized more and more risks in different parts of the world. But it hasn't changed an awful lot over the years, to be honest with you. It's just still a fundamental kind of anchor to which we manage our water risk is through our water stewardship strategy. And like every other company, we're managing our water and own operations. But as I said before, we need to look well beyond our own operations and into our communities and into our supply chains and into global advocacy. And this is what's really changing the dial in terms of managing our water risk. We can be the most efficient brewery or distillery in the world uh, in terms of liter per liter use, but actually that won't in any way uh, mitigate our physical water risk in that catchment. So we need to work with others. And I think if I was to pull out uh, the, the most important element of this water stewardship strategy uh, would be around collective action in catchments, working with government, civil society, NGOs and others to manage the systemic issues in that catchment, which are very contextual based. And uh, I think that's probably the most important thing Diazu can do to manage its water risk and get that message across to our investors and other stakeholders. So a really, really fundamental way to have an integrated approach to water risk management through our corporate water stewardship strategy, recognizing that a lot of this is not within our uh, own hands. It has to be working with others. Next slide, please. And just to finish, it's no surprises we're, we're investing. We have been investing and we continue to invest. And that's not necessarily just in our water stressed areas. So the bottom right hand here is about Riparian, uh, uh, riparian initiatives al along our Spey Valley in the northeast of Scotland, a famous whiskey growing, a whiskey distilling area, uh, and very much part of our uh, water management uh, portfolio. But also in the top left, we announced a, 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 a significant um, investment in water reuse in sub Saharan Africa. In the middle there, you've got some water and wastewater, wastewater, sorry, valorization project in, in Mexico as well. So Across the board, we're looking at continuing to invest, but as I said, not just in our own operations, but also in the catchment more broadly. Anyway, I hope that's uh, given you a flavor for what Viage is doing and how with the frameworks we're using. The, the key lesson we're taking is we have to embed this into our, uh, straight, um, our normal strategic business management, how we manage disruptive forces in our business, how we manage risk, uh, and integrating that to in the systems and the measuring reporting, quantifying, and disclosing that uh, absolutely is critical to the success of uh, integrating our water risk. Uh, so thank you for your time. I'll hand over to uh, Francesco now.
Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, good morning, good evening to you all. Uh, Francesco Curto, uh, I am the Global Head of Research at uh, DWS. Uh, so today what I'm going to talk to you about is, uh, you know, how disclosure is important for us as investors and uh, what's changing and what we make of uh, all the work that has been done. You know, when uh, Francesca and I had a conversation early in the year, you know, she said, you know, what is that investors are expecting? And I think that is important as we talk about disclosure, that we understand that, you know, first principles, ultimately, we need to think that disclosure is there to serve the owner of the capital, the owner of the AstraZeneca, the owner of the Diageo of the world, because these people ultimately have got uh, something in mind when they're investing in this company, right? And I think that has really changed over the last few years is that we are moving from a world where uh, investors were just uh, interested in maximization of financial return into a world where basically they want to understand not only you know, how you achieve that financial return and what is the risk to that financial return, to see also you know, what is the impact that I'm having as a citizen, as a person on the world when I am uh, providing capital to that company. So we see this rise of uh, the sustainable investor, the person that is interested in what I'm getting, but how am I impacting the world as well? And disclosure has to play an important role here because ultimately, you know, myself as, a, as an asset manager, I need sort of then to make sure that capital is properly provided to the people that are having a positive impact or, and we are starving the people that have a negative impact on the world. And that is where the big challenge is, you know, from a disclosure perspective. This is why, you know, we have, uh, uh, we really welcome the work that CDSB has been doing and uh, Francesca and Ravi have been doing. But to a large extent, it is very important that we are very clear that you know, all this disclosure that we're getting today, you know, presenting the massive improvements that we have had over the last few years is really just focusing on single materiality. Okay, what we are getting here is an understanding of how water risk and climate change risk may affect the financial return that the company may achieve into the future or is achieving now, yeah, and how companies are getting ready for that. But we really don't have a good understanding about, you know, is this approach really sustainable? Is there circularity in the business model? You know, how are we making sure that, you know, the water uh, risk, you know, for citizens, for society is also being addressed? And why is this important? Because, you know, water is a polyhedric element, is one of the most difficult elements to assess because water is both an input factor into the, into the manufacturing process. Uh, you know, you see it that in the, in the case of Diageo, it's very clear, right? You know, you, you need that in order to get the drinks. Uh, but it's also, you know, a, 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 an output factor, okay? is a waste, okay? So there is a lot of elements that get thrown back into the environment as a result of this. Um, and that type of uh, treatment of waste uh, is key because especially we, you know, it affects, for example, biodiversity. Uh, so, you know, we as investors, we are very aware that, you know, pharmaceutical companies have been doing fantastic work on this, but it's also very clear that, you know, antibiotics, uh, uh, you know, they go through into wastewater and have actually an important impact on the world. And that is something on biodiversity specifically. And that is something that, you know, our understanding is really the beginning in regard to all of these factors, okay? You know, it is uh, really something that is a major challenge. I mean, it's already a, a great result what we have been achieving with single materiality. But the point that I want to make today is that really, you know, we have not, finished with this work, okay? You know, this is just the beginning because as Ravi was saying, the concept of materiality is a dynamic one. And clearly we have a situation where investors' expectations are 
clearly changing on a day by day. And it's important that you know, we provide uh, the information for this. And I have to not hide to you, uh, you know, a main challenge that we as investors are facing, which is, uh, you know, the world of disclosure. Uh, wow, wow, you know, and you just need to spend some time looking at all different standards and disclosure and the regulation, SFRD and European Union. I mean, I cannot, uh, I, you know, I had sort of almost to give up my job as a, as a real research analyst to become an expert in fact finding about what is going on, uh, you know, climate change. But ultimately, and this is where you all can play an important role, is that in order to have a proper working of capital markets, we need to have a division of powers. Okay, this is a fundamental, you know, criteria of any democratic, uh, you know, uh, system, which is you people cannot ask financial analysts with a financial background to become experts on climate change and water risk on biodiversity. Uh, we need uh, to have a proper independent uh, uh, organizations that are in charge of defining disclosure, what is uh, required, because at the moment, you know, I am being asked to play God and I cannot play God, right? You know, my background is financial analysis. I don't know anything about science. I'm getting good at it, but there's still much work to be done on that, uh, you know, scientific tree. And I'm not sure that given my age, I'll ever get good at this. So, you know, let's uh, sort of try to get help from the scientists, uh, because what we really need as an investment community is to have independent standards, not provided by companies that are, uh, are conflicted in here, independent standards that are informed by science. Okay, because science ultimately will tell us, uh, and it's very clear, yeah, uh, if you look at the Das Gupta review, it's very clear that our economic model in the last 50 years has got massive improvements in terms of life expectancy, has got massive improvements in terms of GDP, but also has brought a 50% reduction in the, the stock of natural capital. So it's very clear that, you know, our economic models are not sustainable. And you know, given that you know, we play an important role in that uh, decision making about you know, this is a sustainable company, this is not. You know, we really need you know help from uh, uh, from governments, from all of you to put pressure on the right people to have this independence uh, of standards that is going to be supported by science, so that we can uh, take. Uh, you know, a proper decisions based on this. Uh, so there is still a lot of work to do, but today is a day to really congratulate the CDSB team on the excellent work that they've been doing, you know, on this because uh, uh, they have been a pioneer in uh, understanding the importance of uh, standardizing disclosures with regard to water risk. Uh, and with that, I will pass it to Francesca. Thank you very much and, uh, and enjoy the rest of uh, uh, the week. Th thanks, Francesca. So just um, just to say, like, so uh, one word of Francesca's work, he published in a, a, an amazing, um, yeah, paper, that, and, and you can find it in the resource, <laughs> thanks to the, uh, in the resource section of the Pathable form. So this is like, you, you have the link here, but you have also the paper there. So uh, it's an interesting uh, paper to read. <laughs> And yeah, so like, uh, what can I say? So thanks Ravi and thanks all, all the wonderful speakers for the inter interesting presentations and for being perfectly on time. That, that This was a challenge. So I am Francesca Recanati, CDSB Technical Manager. So, um, so to cl quickly wrap up, so we have heard of uh, the current dynamic and evolving reporting environment. Um, the increasing request of corporate water disclosure from regulators and investors due to the materiality of water related risk, risk which is dynamic as Ravi and Francesco pointed out. And on the corporate side, uh, uh, the importance of water stewardship in the business strategy uh, also linked to, to, to climate change, a strong link. So all of these aspects underline the importance of water, water stewardship and of comprehensive and effective water disclosures. 
Um, for for this reason, uh, so if you can go to the next slide, thank you. For this reason, um, as Ravi kindly introduced and uh, other speaker like also like touched upon this, uh, at the beginning of of the like during this event, we at CDSB developed an application uh, guidance of the CDSB framework that it's already available since like 10 years. Um, that is specific, this guidance that is specific for water disclosures and aims to help uh, report preparer pre in preparing information to be included in the mainstream report, which are useful to investors. Uh, of course, it's the first uh, first step of, in this journey uh, and what we, we, we can always improve. Uh, and so starting from the CDSB framework reporting requirement that you can see here on this slide, uh, that illustrate what to report and are very much aligned with the, with the safety recommendation. This guidance focuses on, on governance, strategy, policy and targets and their management, risks and opportunities, sources of impact, performance and future outlook, including scenario analysis, of course, uh, relating to water. So this document has, has been developed uh, starting from uh, a review of existing water reporting standards and frameworks and other related documents. And the, the whole process has been supported by a fantastic working group of more than 70 water experts, including corporates, uh, investors and NGOs. The guidance uh, thus um, considers specific characteristics of water issues that are maybe a bit different from, from climate issues uh, and of business um, water interactions, such as local dimension of water, uh, its time variability, think about seasonality, uh, the multifaceted nature of water issues, and the fact that they are interconnected with other environmental and social issues, uh, like for example, climate change, land use, land use change, and on the importance of engaging and collaborating with stakeholders from supply chain to, to, go, to governments, and all uh, the topics uh, that, that were covered in previous presentations. Um, so given the, this general overview, a few words on the content of the guidance, uh, in particular on the elements that support report preparer, preparers. So for each of the reporting topic that I just mentioned, uh, or better, um, like can also be framed at CDSB reporting requirements, uh, you, you will find some reporting suggestions and guidance, so some text that guides you on, guides you on how to report, a disclosure checklist. So for example, here we see disclosure checklist for governance, uh, reference to external resources um, that, for example, just to name one, uh, the tools that are available to assess water-related risks, for example, and uh, fourth, uh, fourth po like element, very important, examples of good practices from corporate mainstream reports. Uh, besides this, there are uh, some additional practical elements, such as like a flowcharts that illustrate how to approach and develop water-related financial disclosures. So like that, like it's a tentative to guide you on how to have, uh, like to include water in your mainstream report and integrate it with financial disclosures. Um, the second element is a table, uh, including examples of water-related risks and opportunities. And, and some of them, like uh, we, we heard of in previous pre pre presentation, and also their financial implications. Uh, to guide, for example, risks assessment, risk assessment. And the third very important element, and hopefully very useful, it's a table that maps the CDSB requirements with TCFD uh, like pillars and other reporting standards and frameworks. Uh, so this table aims to reduce the report, reporting burden uh, by showing how information collated for other reports, for example, CDP questionnaires, uh, GRI uh, or SASB standards, just to name three, can be used to integrate water in the mainstream reports. Uh, final comment before closing. So this guidance is specific for water, but we are more than aware that uh, addressing environmental and sustainability issues, adopting a silos approach is not effective. So that is why in the water guidance, we included links to other environmental uh, and social aspects, besides links to financial ones, of course. So we are continuing this journey beyond climate disclosures and our next guidance will focus on biodiversity disclosure and, um, and what risk company may face uh, with onset of biodiversity cost uh, crisis, sorry. And if you're interested in the current status of uh, like disclosure on, on this like environmental topics uh, and in some stats, uh, last year we reviewed uh, Europe's largest listed companies and identified the strengths and weaknesses uh, of reporting uh, on climate, 
PCFT, biodiversity and, and water. And yeah, so we have some, like short briefings on, on including these stats and you, you have the link in these slides, but also uh, link in this resource sections, section of Pathable. Uh, and with these, I would like to thank you all very much for, for your attention and for being here today. And now I'm, if we have a few minutes for a couple of questions, I'm giving back the floor to Ravi to see. Yeah, if we have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you ever so much, Francesca. Um, uh, a big pat on the back for taking such leadership on this um, water application guidance from start to finish. Um, and thank you to a, a wonderful panel. You've provided such wonderful knowledge to, um, to, 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 to our audience. So um, really appreciate that. So just some initial questions. Um, now I'm going to direct the initial question to, um, to to the corporate, so to Michael and Frederick. So, what are the first steps an entity can do to implement water risks um, uh, and the examination uh, into business? So, um, Michael, can I um, uh, start with yourself? Yeah, I think it starts with what you started off, Ravi, which was materiality. So it's a it's a it's a footprint and uh, it's understanding. The context of your water use in your business whatever business it is and it's more obvious for a beverage company than it is for a bank but uh everywhere and everybody's supply chain water is important and i think that's the place to start would be that materiality and of course the the guidance takes uh, and there's many other guidances around to take a a newcomer as it were through that step-by-step -step process but uh i think it's a little bit different from a carbon and climate change more you know more uh greenhouse gases in that it is so contextually important. So that context of uh, each and every uh, use of water uh, across the supply chains and across um, investments, it might be from banks and investments funds we heard from Francesco. So I think uh, I think it's really important to start off with that materiality, but there is an awful lot of guidance out there, as I said, to help companies starting and go through a, a very systematic method, uh, process uh, to understand and manage uh, water risk. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, Frederick. Yeah, thanks. I can just build on what you said, Michael. I think that was very well said. And uh, in our case, we had great help starting understanding the materi materiality by, by using the water filter tool from WWF, an open, open uh, free tool to use. So I can really recommend that. And to us, it was a good thing to, to really broaden the, the water. <laughs> context and a local context uh, with quality how our own emissions impact that water resource in combination with other stakeholders in that limited river basin i think that's helped us a bit to to take um, a bit of a new perspective and uh, and then i think to us also in, in, integrating it into our uh, normal risk management process is also helpful uh, and, and a powerful internal process that everyone recognizes and uh, have respect for, and also uh, linking in a nice way over to to the financial process to to when we need to mitigate, we have that process in place. So I think that's a good thing as well, advice as well. Oh, that what fantastic response to say. Thank you so much, um, um, Frederick and Michael. Um, we have a, a minute left, um, and I am conscious that I really would like to pose some questions to the investor side. So you're going to have to keep it uh, like possibly a one-word response. So what would you want from uh, from an entity when disclosing um, uh, risk disclosure? So um, what 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 would you ideally want? And then I'll just close it off, and um, uh, we'll go from there. Sorry, was that for me, Ravi? Yeah, yeah, to yourself, please. I mean, you know, each, frankly, simplicity. You know, tell me what the risks are, you know, how financially material they are, because you have that analysis, but you are scared of presenting it. And, you know, that forces, you know, all of us into so much work. But ultimately, you know, the investors is investing for the long term, wants to understand not what has happened yesterday, which is what most of the disclosure has happened about, but is what is going to happen to the future. And if we can, uh, you know, there is a beauty in simplicity. Yeah, there is something that is really, and the issue we have is that it's becoming more and more complex and more and more expensive. 
And we need sort of to reconcile, you know, relevance, materiality with simplicity. That would be my 30 seconds uh, plea to, <laughs> you know, the, the, the companies that are doing this program. And thank you ever so much. And just a given a nod to both Ron and Raphael for your fantastic comments. So I'm just going to cut this off now. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, please do get started. There's a lot of material out there, as Michael has alluded to. And uh, please do go and download this uh, water application start um, application guidance. And um, yeah, be bold and go on. Yeah, go and be bold. So all the best and good luck. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.